Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to this week's Garden DC podcast. We have with us two friends of mine who are authors of a brand new book called Deer Resistant Native Plants for the Northeast, and that is Greg Tepper and Ruth Rogers Clausen. Welcome, Greg and Ruth. Thank you. And before we go too much more into it, I just want to point out in the title that the Northeast is Northeast United States, um, since we do have some international listeners to the Garden DC podcast, and native plants as in native indigenous to the mid-Atlantic and the northeastern United States, because all plants are native to somewhere, right? Yes, you all got right. it. <laughs> so before you got together and wrote this book, you both had two separate lives and lots of experiences and wonderful backgrounds, and you have both wear many hats and have your fingers in many pies. So let's explore that a little bit and then how you both converged and got together to write this uh, practical and wonderful book. And let's start with you, Ruth. Okay, well, thank you. It's really nice of you to have us here, Kathy. We're very pleased to be talking to you. Um, I came from the UK. I was trained in England in, at a horticultural college called Studley College, which was all women um, back in the good old days, so to speak. But anyway, um, it was a, a really, really good school and hands-on, hands-on as well as lectures. But prior to that, I was in boarding school in the Cotswolds at a place called Westenburg, which orchid growers will recognize that name because there's the, the Holford Medal, which is the uh, Holford family owned Westenburg. And also they collected uh, seed, tree seed particularly at the turn of the century. And there are some trees there on the grounds, fantastic grounds. Um, that was, uh, the trees now are big, of course, they're mature, but they were started around the turn of the century and they came, um, you know, he, uh, Lord Helford collected seeds from people that were exploring. So anyway, that was pretty exciting. And uh, so then um, I came to America, oh goodness, long, long time ago, in the early 60s. And I've been in horticulture actually for over 60 years, so I've been around quite a lot. <laughs> I was working originally at Yoder's in Barberton, the first people who did the all year round mums. And I note, note also with sadness that Ramsey Yoder just passed away a couple of weeks ago. I think he was uh, the last of the family, I believe. Anyway, horticulture.com and that's the same company. And I worked for them for five and a half years, went to grad school, got out of grad school, decided to come to New York, worked in the York Botanical Garden. Um, and I actually, I'm still connected with the Botanical Garden. I was um, involved with the School of Professional Horticulture. We didn't call it then, we just called it SOPS at that time. <laughs> but anyway, now it's very posh and it's the, the, uh, the SOPH program, which is a two-year two program or 18-month program, hands-on and some lectures as well. And that's still going strong. And we have, in fact, uh, I think six or seven, maybe eight, graduated just last week, which was quite exciting. And people go from there, they come from all works of, walks of life. Many of them have uh, already have a degree um, and some of them are midlife changers and so forth. And uh, so anyway, they're scattered all over the country now in, in some good positions. Anyway, since um, I've had my family, they're all grown now. And then we came down to, from New York to um, Eastern Maryland about seven, almost seven years ago. And I've been writing since um, the 80s. Um, the first book was Perennials for American Gardens that I wrote with the late Nikki Ekstrom. And then since then I've been writing and lecturing and so on and so forth, doing whatever I can uh, as and when I can. So when I have to you know, do it between kids and all that stuff, you have to pull back <laughs> to that. So wow. enough, enough. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot, but I, just to clarify, a couple things for listeners, Yoder's, Y-O-D-E-R, correct? Yes. 
not Yoda. Don't get too excited. <laughs> and then how do you spell that it was a hof the the tree place in England? Western Birch. The Holford family. H-O-L-F-O-R-D. H-O-L-F-O-R-D. Okay. Because it sounded almost a little bit like Hoffman, but that's good. No, 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 that's no, no. no. This is the, the, the Holford family were big um plant people. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you things about that school another time. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll have to do an episode called Tales Out of School or something like that. <laughs> it was a fantastic place. If you ever go, you could go around the grounds and they're magnificent. Nice. Something to look forward to post-COVID travel to get over mm -hmm. to that. All right. Well, let's, let's bring Greg in the conversation. So, Greg, you have a, a tough act to follow with Ruth. <laughs> oh, indeed, indeed, I sure, I sure do. Thanks for th so much for having us, Kathy. We really appreciate it. Um, so, I um, um, the uh, I grew up in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, on a wooded lot. So, I very early on, I got to learn about uh, the native plants that naturally grew in the woods. Um, that was before we had deer there. That today, the deer are just all over the place in that same area, but. Um, it's fortunately at the time I was able to garden before deer were a main, main issue. But I went from, from there to um, attending the University of Delaware uh, and then had my own um, horticultural maintenance business. So I took care of clients that were in <clears throat> the Delaware Valley area in Pennsylvania and several counties there and deer were, were uh, ever omnipresent, always there. So that was something I learned very early on that uh, um, how to deal with the deer and what they ate and didn't eat. Um, and then um, after having my own horticultural maintenance business in 2005, I started as the horticulturist at uh, for the Woods Path at Mount Cuba Center in Hocuston, Delaware. And it was there until 2013. Went from there uh, to the director of horticulture position at Delaware Botanic Gardens. And both Mount Cuba Center and Delaware Botanic Gardens also had deer present. Even though we had deer fences, the deer still got in. So my experience is through several uh, different places and quite a few different counties and states as well. And after you left Delaware Botanic Gardens, where are you at currently? So I went from there and I accepted a really awesome position as a horticulturist at two historic cemeteries, believe it or not. Oh. Um, beautiful, beautiful arboretum grounds. And they have uh, intense deer pressure at the one, uh, but not at the other. Oh. So um, we will certainly talk about the plants that I've chosen from my experience there in Montgomery County. Uh, but but yes, I'm a horticulturist at an arboretum um, at a cemetery. Nice. And that would be for my listeners close into DC, Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, not Montgomery County, Maryland. You got it. <laughs> where, where the cemeteries are. So, and yeah, I'm always fascinated by horticulture at cemeteries. And wherever I travel, I try to do a little side trip and uh, to visit a local cemetery and we've done a couple stories for Washington Gardener magazines about some of our historic mm -hmm. cemeteries in the city. So there's so much there that, uh, you know, it, they're basically public gardens in yes. the most mm -hmm. basic sense of a public garden. Literally, you can walk in and enjoy <laughs> the plantings. And they were some of our original parks as well, before the park system was even in existence. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. Nice. Well, one of the, the phrases that you use, Greg, I wanted to latch on to when you said before deer, um, maybe we'll call that BD and AD, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. There was a time, right? Yep. yep. So well, it's usually, yeah. it's usually caused from, uh, it's, it's caused from human pressure, people mm -hmm. moving in, um, the woodlands disappearing and the deer have to go wherever they can go to to sustain themselves uh and they figure out what tastes really good in your garden that's for sure yeah and it's not just that it's also that you know we had a low steady deer population you know for a good century or so but then we created the perfect habitat which is the edge habitat for the deer and they like that edge of the woodland and what is every suburban cul-de-sac every little stream valley park instead of making these huge deep forests which deer and most creatures don't go into the depth of and and we just have edge 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 highway edge edge yep. of at woods everywhere so we've created you know for ourselves this perfect storm of deer population 
and in my deer talk, I don't know about Ruth, when you give deer talks, I always talk about the um, uh, exponential growth now because every doe can have two fawns on average because of all the extra food that's available. So they'll usually have a set of twins and they're reproductive for about 10 years of their life. So mm -hmm. one doe equals 20. So, and that's every generation, every decade, every decade. So mm. every, every doe that drops, I mean, every, every fawn that is dropped will always go back to that property of its birth mm. that forever and ever, I'm in. That's so a good point, dear. Yep. You, if, if, you see a, if you see a pregnant doe on your property, just gently move it over the property line. <laughs> <laughs> I'm imagining this doe mid-birth. <laughs> yeah, honestly. <laughs> yeah. And you're we like, <laughs> and you put her in a wheelbarrow and you escort her next door. <laughs> <laughs> a, a nice little flat of impatience or something just to yes, keep... you say. Yeah. Well, there is also that that point too that what deer don't eat they sleep on, right? <laughs> so mm -hmm. even though say hellebores, which is not a native plant, but it's something that ma not palatable to deer, that's a great bedding plant for deer. <laughs> so they- Yeah. Yep. And there's there's also the issue of buck rub too, which, mm. which we don't address as much in our book, but mm -hmm. I think that's where the strategy of using repellents will help. And we can talk about that for sure. Yeah, definitely. So what we didn't knit together yet is how you, Ruth and Greg, got together and what was the germination of the book? Like, what made you write it? Go ahead, Greg. Gosh, well, Ruth and I love this. We both love the story. Um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> when, when I was a, a director of horticulture at DBG, I, I had a um, that was, uh, I lived in Philadelphia, but had a, a rental place in Delaware. And so um, I asked Ruth to join the board because uh, she was a, uh, a known author and, and uh, um, many, many years of experience. And it said it made sense to have a board member of, with horticultural knowledge also on the board at the time. So uh, Ruth joined and um, she, would, she would come for board meetings. She'd come for help working in the gardens. And she she would stay at my place in the guest room. And so it was great. It, we got to know each other better and, and eat together and have such a good time. And one night there was this conversation and I'll let Ruth take this part. Well, yeah, I was, I was, we were talking about the deer, I guess, at uh, DBG and so forth and the problems and so on and so forth. And Greg said, oh, you know, you could, we, but I'd really like to write a book. I really want all my life. I'd want to write a book. And I said, well, what's stopping you? So, <laughs> so I, and I said, well, why don't we just do it? You know, I mean, what's the big deal? <laughs> Nothing like tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, we got, we started writing and so forth. And we just thought it was a pretty good idea, particularly, I mean, I had already written 50 beautiful deer resistant plants that actually is still in print and is still doing very well for which I am most grateful but there was nothing that was specific for natives. And of course, natives, particularly with all of the work that Doug Tallamy that has been, do, has been doing and the lectures and so forth about pollinators and all this. And we thought, well, this would be something that would be useful to the general public because so many people want to plant native plants now um, for various reasons. So uh, that's how it came about. And we just started, I talked to um, Tom Fisher at Timber Press who I had written for before and he was was extremely encouraging and said go for it so we did that's great yeah. and yeah so your previous book on 50 beautiful deer resistant wow. plants is there might be a few natives in there but it's yeah. not aimed at natives. Yeah. <laughs> but that one is a great that's a great resource to start off with for the home gardener and then this one covers you say northeast it's basically north carolina up through the mm -hmm. eastern united states yeah, yeah. Each entry is marked which states particularly. Mm -hmm. So that's a help for people who um, maybe if you know if you're living in Maine and the stuff is is fine down here, it might not be very good for them. Mm -hmm. There's and actually quite a few plants from the southeast mm -hmm. that thrive in higher um, in uh, hardiness zones that you would think they may not, and that's one of the things we wanted to also bring to people's attention. Some of the uh, more southern plants that would 
thrive in northern gardens and also uh, not be on the deer's uh, to, to eat list. Exactly. Well, that's a great idea because with climate change, we're hearing these days that you should start actually sourcing native plants from the zone below you in anticipation that in 10 or 20 years that that's going to be your hardiness zone in your area, that the natives are essentially going to be moving north. Yep. Yeah. I thought there was a knock at the door, but nope. <laughs> a ghost knocked. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. getting back to um, the natives in the Northeast, that is a perennial question, no pun intended, um, at a lot of deer talks and deer things is, are what won't the deer eat? And if the deer have evolved with the local native flora, then it makes sense that they're going to eat it all. But what remains um, in a forest that deer have gone through? Well, Kathy, right off the bat, let's get this straight. There is no such thing as deer proof. Mm -hmm. I mean, that people say, oh, deer, it's deer proof, it's deer proof. There's nothing, I mean, maybe a you know, 40 foot high oak tree or something, but really there's mm -hmm. nothing that is that you can say at this plant is deer proof. Um, barbed wire does what fine. <laughs> you claim they're not gonna eat that probably. But nevertheless, you need to have, um, even if you're protecting your plants you need with fences and other things that people need to do, it has to be really thought out carefully. And, you know, when people talk about, oh, this pup is deer proof and everybody says, not in my garden. So, um, you know, I think we need to make that clear from the from the get go, so to speak. Agreed, That's these are point. these are selections based upon, um, the combined uh, experiences of both Ruth and myself. Um, There's some uh, plants in there that um, uh, Ruth has had great success with the deer not bothering. Um, and I, I've i actually seen some, sometimes they'll, they'll eat a certain part of it. So we're gonna talk about that today. We have a, a deer resistance um, rating mm -hmm. and then also a, a strategy about uh, what you can do if there are certain parts that are eaten um, how we can work with repellents to to try to have the nicest garden we can. Yeah, that's a great point that, first of all, deer in different areas develop different relationships with their local plants. And yes. then every doe passes on to their fawn lessons. And she says, eat this, not this. Um, so it, it seems very hyper local, I want to say. Well, it is except except for the brand new fawns. They're just like toddlers that put everything in their mouth. <laughs> you got to try it one time, right? Yeah, nope, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> even, if even if it's poisonous, you just spit it back out. Just spit, it, spit it back out. It'll taste terrible. <laughs> Be poisonous. It just another smell. another big part of it actually too is not just taste it's smell mm -hmm. deer have an acute sense of smell so they they they're not they're not they can't see too well but they sure can smell and they can taste um and so it, the smells are going to be a, a big part of what keep deer from eating certain things and it's also part of what works with the repellent strategy which we'll talk mm -hmm. about yeah one of the ones you listed in the book uh, Menarda. Is, is a great example of that because it's got that, to us, beautiful, spicy fragrance to our nose. But I imagine to a deer with just hypersensitive smell, you know, 10 to 100 times a human beings, that that was probably like being sprayed in the face with Lysol or something to smell that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I like to think of the uh, anything in the mint family is almost guaranteed to, to not uh, uh, be palatable to deer and things that to us smell so good to them it's almost like I guess you could think of it as as maybe um you know like ammonia that that really to us it, it's just really repellent um or horseradish that's another thing yeah to, well, yeah yep. and that's the kind of that's how they respond to these smells as well yeah and so we can go with highly scented or pungent plants as one of the clues. Um, how about the level or height of the plant? I know that there are some that are considered deer resistant because they're either above or below the browse line. Mm, yep. Well, that's true, especially especially with some of the evergreens because you can see where they've been planted. And then very often from about five or six feet um, down, they're naked and above that, then they're looking nice and bushy and happy. But mm -hmm. Um, obviously, the the deer can can um, you know they can only reach so far. Fortunately, 
I mean, we don't yeah. want to on steroids, that's for sure. So um, down below the below, I don't think if they're if they're really hungry, they're gonna they're gonna you know browse like a cow more or less right at ground level. I haven't noticed anything particular about them not going below their knees, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about you, Greg. That's something. Yeah, I, I've seen them browse right onto the ground. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. I haven't seen uh, anything, but it, it is important, I think, particularly if you have bird feeders and stuff like that in your garden, which a lot of people like to do, make sure that those are too high or are completely out of reach uh, for, for deer. Um, I, have, I have found to my chagrin, at the old house we had in New York, we had a whole resident herd, which was how actually the first year book came about. Mm. Um, so I have a nice picture of a deer that's clambering up a bird feeder and uh, just having a nice snack. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, that makes, that's a good point about uh, garden hygiene as well. So deer, you know, obviously bird feed that might be spilled on the ground and probably fruit tree droppings. Right. What other things do you think that we need to clean up from the garden to keep down the deer? Oh, acorns. Acorn. Oh, that great point. Big time, big time for acorns. And very often, and this is not proven, of course, but what I have noticed, and I I believe it to the, my dying day, that when you have a very crop heavy uh, acorn crop one year, you're going to get a ton of deer the following spring. Yeah, same thing with the squirrel population explosion. Yeah, agreed. I don't have deer now, but I have squirrels instead, which are much worse. <laughs> <laughs> At least you can see them. Don't go so fast. <laughs> Another thing too, Kathy, I wanted to bring up was maturity of the foliage. Ruth and I have talked about this a great deal. For example, Heliopsis, Helianthoides. Uh, really, I know Ruth is going to make a comment here because she thinks <laughs> all I can focus on is daisy-like plants, but oh, they well, do yeah. play a very good role. <laughs> um, so I'm using that one as, a, as an example. When it's tender new growth emerging from the ground, the deer are going to nibble that, especially mm -hmm. in the earlier spring when there's not as much around. Well, as, that, so, oh, as, as that matures, um, that foliage um, toughens up a little bit. It actually becomes a little more sour, or not as tasty, and, the, and they really leave it alone. So I find that to be a plant that in the early spring, when tender growth is coming up, that's when I'll spray it with a, a concentrated deer repellent. But after that, I've found no reason to to have to um, to to spray, which is good. It once it's mature, it seems to be good. Yeah. Kathy, let me give you another example of, of new young growth like that. Um, well, two things actually. Um, if you think of boxwood, the young will go to and eat the boxwood shoots when they're tiny. I mean, up to uh, maybe until they, the wood becomes a little lignified, and they will chew on that and. You know that because everybody says, "Oh, nobody, they never touch boxwood." Well, they jolly well do. So um, that's one thing. But um, the other thing I was going to mention too, something about it. Well, it, it, it'll pass. It'll come back to me in a minute. Or two. <laughs> yeah, that is, a, that is yeah. a great point about the boxwood because they're supposed to be deer-proof, obviously, but they're doing our our pruning for us right there. And same thing with our ferns. The the fiddleheads are obviously edible for us too. Uh, if we get them as just as they emerge in the springtime, then they're delicious. But would we ever consider eating a fern frond later in the season? No, <laughs> that would be insane. Right. So yeah, it's great a uh, uh, point to that. Some things might need extra protection as they're just emerging and still tender greens. And then you could maybe pull off either that netting or stop the spraying or whatever you're doing to protect them um, once they've established themselves later in the season. Exactly. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your rating system in the book. So it's not one through 10. You start off with plants that are at least seven, right, on your scale. Mm -hmm. Yep, we figured hostas and things are one. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you is, what are what's one through six that didn't make the book? <laughs> like flocks, deer yeah. love flocks. Yep, mm -hmm. I've even seen them eat more mature mature leaves off flocks they just love it so that wouldn't be included in our book but ones that um like if if we give a rating to seven like on rudbeckia trilova some people say oh they mow that right down but it's been our experience that deer um will only they'll they'll get the tender growth 
and maybe some of the newest tender flowers early on or you know later in the season but they don't tend to for the most part touch that so that's why you see a seven to ten rating um now the the other part of it too is when you have plants that are in the seven to ten rating if you use some kind of repellent you're going to have a much better chance of being able to have them in your garden and and not have the deer bother them so it's a combined strategy it's it's plants they don't prefer plus plus repellents if possible yeah what type of repellents do you recommend greg so i can base this on on two that i have used for many many years and had repeated success and this is success not only in montgomery county pennsylvania but uh delaware county pennsylvania um also in uh, sussex and newcastle counties in delaware um so uh the, the two products I really like, one is called Deer Stopper. And it's, it's a, it's a, um, it is a concentrated repellent. Uh, it's mint oil, rosemary oil, and emulsified eggs. And the way that it works is the emulsified eggs help it stick onto the plant. So once it dries, that mint and rosemary that we love, mm-hmm. but the deer hate, both plants in the mint family, uh, they stay away from. And it has a pretty good efficacy period of up to 30 days. That's good. Yeah. The next one is called Deer Scram and wow. it's a it's a granular. I can buy it on Amazon in 25 gallon buckets. And you don't need to spread a whole lot, but if you spread it with regularity, it's again about a 3 week period that it it's it has efficacy. Um I tend to apply in the gardens that I work in, um I can't possibly apply it to every single plant every time I'm there. So I try to, I just try to make sure I touch as many as I can and, and, and be- go back and forth between uh, concentrate and, and granular. And for the deer scram granules, you're just sprinkling them around the root zone of the plants. So I started originally just not naturally just spr- sprinkling them. So, so uh, purposefully now I just cast it. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I have one air that it's almost like a three quarter acre meadow. I, I have to, I can't take the time to drop it onto the ground. The advantage of doing both sprinkling it, um, it doesn't hurt the foliage. Mm-hmm. Um, it's best down on the ground. It really is because the smell is there. The deer are going to smell it, even if it's, it's preferably not on the foliage, but down on the ground. The other thing that helps with are groundhogs mm-hmm. and rabbits and rabbits yes yeah so definitely it's, it's, a good point that if yeah. pretty much if it repels deer it repels rabbits and same thing on there do you find the same thing on the deer resistant versus rabbit resistant plant palettes that's a very good question because i haven't studied the rabbit issue as much but it seems like in the areas where i have used repellents and i've used deer resistant plants as i've learned I, i'd say oh they're not gonna eat the samsonia mm-hmm. I, ha- I have to say the, the the rabbits don't seem to touch it. Um, and I think I can only say it's because I've used the repellents, mm-hmm. I think. But to say whether these are also rabbit resistant plants, it's hard to, for me to say that, yeah. No, I don't think that's true. I don't think if they're deer resistant, they're gonna be rabbit resistant as well. Yeah, I, I, that would make sense, yeah. Mm-hmm. But Matthew, let me just interject here a moment. I mean, I I have used deer scrap. I'm not a, I'm not a person that sprays. First of all, I'm not going to lug a piece of equipment around with me. But secondly, I just don't want to do it. So the only thing that I have used for deer, and this was in New York again, that was deer scrap. When it came out first, actually, I used it. And it was just like going out to feeding the chickens. You know, you just throw it out. I was not careful. Greg works in a public garden, basically. I work in a very different field. And I think there are many people, probably some of your listeners who maybe are gonna say, oh, I'm never gonna spray anything. I'm never gonna spray anything. They're just, you know, they're anti-spray, which is perfectly fine and dandy to each his own. But um, I must say that the deer scrap, when I was creating this garden in New York, it was about an acre and a bit with a stream at the bottom that the deer came and they would drink there. We did not fence it. First of all, we couldn't afford it. And secondly, I did not want to, um, you know, keep the, them away from their drinking hole. So, um, what I mean, I just concentrated and built up a collection of, of deer resistant plants and observed them and, and used them all the time. And then sometimes, let's say, for example, I wanted to put in some very early spring color or something with some pansies or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, and I just throw the just cram around. And 
let that take care of itself. Um, but I think it's it's uh, you know with a with a big property such as Greg is is working with, he has to have it looking really good for the public all the time. In a pre residential garden, you don't have that same pressure. So um, the plants that we've selected here are, I mean, th there's a there's a dear candy list even in here of the things that you need to avoid, you know, things that they really go for. If you want to have a party for the deer or something like that, you can plant them. But um, normally, um, you know, I, I just would, would try out different plants, particularly perennials, because that's what I'm interested in mainly. But also, um, you know, there are things like the poppy family that they very seldom go for. They never, very seldom will go for uh, plants that have milky sap, like the milkweeds, uh, things like that. There are generalizations, the ferns they seldom go for. They seldom go for uh, any of the sedges or the gr ornamental grasses. You've got lots of things to choose from. It's not a question of saying, well, I can't have a garden. That's what I've heard so many times. I'm I'm sure you have too, Kathy. Yes. Oh, no, I can't grow garden. What they're talking about is putting lettuce right in the deer run. You know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's a good idea. So, yeah. um, you know, I think uh, it's it's uh, it all has to be quantified, so to speak. But nevertheless, the deer scram on a small scale that I can cope with. You know, take a coffee cup out if you need to, or something like that. Yeah sprinkle it around, um, it does work extremely well, particularly for something that's special that you really, really want to save. Mm -hmm. I was thinking a great use, a reuse would be the Parmesan shaker bottles. Once you're done with your Parmesan, you just fill that with deer scram and just walk yep. around and just yes. act like the garden fairy. And uh, Greg, you were saying that the your preferred spray, you know, you usually have to reapply every 30 days. Um, the deer mm -hmm. scram, does that last most of the season for you? So, so the, the deer scram I've also applied, I, I, I wind up applying them both at the same time because it's just easy to do. Sometimes I overlap, um, but um, I found that deer scram and deer stop for both about 30 days, roughly somewhere around there. So there is a reapplication. Yeah. yeah. And, and what Ruth was saying too, it depends on the, the home gardener. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some of us just don't want to, we, we want to have some plants, but we don't want to spend the time spraying and putting down repellents. If you don't, that's fine. You just know that you're going to have fewer plants that you can grow, but you can still grow some things. Mm -hmm. And, and, but if you're willing to put the time into spraying, you know, which you, you can do, it is a pain. Um, but if you make it a part of your garden maintenance, you, you can, uh, you can uh, grow a lot, a great deal great deal more but it just depends on what the what the home gardener wants to invest in their time some people don't and so you know it makes sense exactly. make you a second class gardener no you, not yeah. at all. no <laughs> definitely not. not at all and most of the, the repellent sprays on the market are completely organic and some of them are actually good for your plants if you read the ingredient list right. so i'm yeah i'm glad you brought that up because because uh, deer stopper and deer scram are two I use because when I had my clients' gardens, they always said the same thing: "Is this okay for my pets?" And that that's a perfectly valid uh, concern. Uh, both of these products um, are are products that can be put down, and uh, the pets stay away from them too. They just don't like the smell of them. So you know that's important. So. And just one more thing too, Kathy, that to go back a little bit, we were talking about uh, the things that, um, you know, the, the type of, of um, vegetation that deer will like. If you over fertilize your plants, or if you fertilize them a lot, you'll, and they have very soft growth, the deer will find that and be quite happy to take care of it. But, you know, a lot of times the people will say, oh yes, I, the deer, you know, they, they, they pruned my, uh, my plants this year because, you know, come May, they decided that they wanted to eat them because the plants were so soft and they, they were growing beautifully. But, you know, all of <laughs> and uh, sometimes it's because the plants have really been, been fed, overfed. I would say uh, often it happens in say a perennial bed or a mixed bed that's alongside a lawn that has been you know fertilized frequently so uh -huh. the, the, the grass will grow more and some of it will just spill over onto the beds so that's something to be careful about not to I mean as I say you know I like to grow my plants uh, lean and hungry so to speak and mm -hmm. not overfeed them so that they're floppy and not only the deer, but also the, you're going to stake the blessed things. But um, you know, it's uh, it's just something to remember in terms of culture. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I think that so often 
we we fertilize things that just don't need to be fertilized. We're always inundated with you got to feed your plants, feed your plants. It's, nope, nope, nope. The the thing is is that the soil, most of our soils, even our poorer soils, as long as they have some organic material in them, there's every typically every nutrient that plant's going to need. And most of our native plants aren't heavy feeders anyway. They really they like leaner soil. So um, I hundred percent agree with Ruth. I think you can probably get a really get away get away from fertilizing and just letting plants exist on on yeah, uh, uh, regular soils unless it's a fruit bearing plant that you're pushing out growth like a yes. tomato yep. High in fox general yeah. yeah in general you know uh ruth calls it lean and hungry gardening i call it survival of the fittest <laughs> and, <laughs> and also being yes. a cheap state i'm gonna call it i'm just gonna call it what it is <laughs> like yeah. right cheaper right. not to throw all that extra fertilizer out that's just going to wash away into our local storm water and you know down into our creeks and stream beds yeah. think what you could do with that money with all the yeah, honestly <laughs> more plants more plants so um you mentioned the deer candy list and so i was just going to read a few of them that kind of surprised me like the um hookera alum root I've, I've found that to be somewhat deer resistant but i think that's the um southern hookera the ones with the fuzzier leaves versus yes. the northern varieties and oh. then lady slipper i'm like you're gonna chomp on that and juniper and native crab apple i can see that and you mentioned the flocks before and then elderberry that was disappointing and upsetting because i just put an <laughs> elderberry at the edge of my property right but then i thought about the um one of the principles farmers use in edible gardening of trap crops. And I was like, well, that could actually be a strategy is to put that deer candy list to use and put those deer candy plants at the very edge or a side portion and say, deer, you have that area and the rest is mine. <laughs> right. And that's how farmers do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a long chat with um, Dan Himes about this one time, mm -hmm. and I found in my New York garden that they will go for um, uh, the ones that are uh, pale colored, the foliage that is on the pale side of coloring. They will see those. Yep. But do not see the ones, the dark, dark leaved ones. They can't see, they can't see that well. And they often, I mean, and I exper experienced and experimented with it in New York. Uh, they went for the, for the light colored ones, but not for the dark colored foliage, which I thought was kind of interesting. And Dan said, well, maybe you've got something there. I said, well, look, I've done it in my own garden. I've tried, you know, lots of different ones. The one key lime pie and some of those light ones, you know, that's are pretty all year round. Um, boy, they would just devastate those. But to go to the dark leaf ones, they almost always left them alone. And maybe that's also because of the lack of chlorophyll in the leaves. So ones like plum pudding and the um, like I have, I think it's wild rose is one of my favorites. They're very dark burgundy. Yes. Um, yeah. So I mean, it's just something to think about, you know, some mm -hmm. of things and we, also uh, my experience with the heucheras is that heuchera macorrhiza or heuchera villosa are the two the straight species i've never had problems with deer they'll eat the flowers sometimes but that's about it yeah um, now the, is hairy leaf hairy leaf. correct you got it exactly hairy leafed and so ones that have the alum root or the heuchera americana very popular with the deer very mm. tender very very delicious so so many of our modern uh heucheras in the gardens are hybrids that have been hybridized for their color and performance uh and and so because of that background um, and different parentage it's could have a very <laughs> uh, uh um i guess appeal to deer so but if you can go with something like autumn bride which is a heuchera velosa or or bronze wave which is another velosa or, or macorrhiza uh, type, um, you'll probably find that better than any of the other heucheras or even saxifrags like Tiarella. Great. And let's talk about a couple of your, what, Ruth, did you have something else to say about heuchera? No, it was not heuchera, but it was the same point um, uh, with roses. They normally, I mean, they'll devastate roses, mm. but they seldom go for Rosa rugosa mm. and also for Rosa rugosa hybrids. 
And so the same way as with the Hucra villosa, if you've got that blood in the cross, in the hybrid, uh, very often you'll make sure that, uh, you know, be pretty certain that the deer are not going to go for it. It's just, you know, it's got that blood in it and they don't like it. Nice. So, uh, yeah. Good to know if, you, if you're wanting to add roses in. So I wanted to ask, uh, so you have your rating system of seven to 10 um, in the book and what are, and this is, this is gonna be hard for each of you to narrow <laughs> down, <laughs> your favorite that's a 10, or maybe you can have one or two favorites that are, that you ranked as a 10. There are no 10s, there are only nine. Oh. Yeah. Okay, yeah. how about close to a 10 that you're like, hmm, uh -huh. just, just almost made it. What do you think, Ruth? Well, you know what I'm going to say. Yeah, as I know what you're going to say. <laughs> right. Set. And I'm going to surprise you. I'm not going to choose another yellow daisy. <laughs> <laughs> really? I like my, one of my favorites is Senna marilandica. Mm. Senna is a, a legume that belongs to the pea family. It gets pretty big. It has yellow flowers, um, uh, uh, foliage similar to, to some of the other legumes and it gets last year in my garden on the corner of my garden it got to be about seven feet tall and they always say it gets to be about maybe five or six mm -hmm. but anyway um i know we have a lot of dog walkers so maybe that has something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> nice anyway it's a plant that i really really like because it blooms for a long time <gasps> and um it's uh, then afterwards the pods are black and they're quite attractive right through into the winter. I try to get them off before they shed seeds because they do tend to seed around a little bit. I wouldn't put them in a you know a, a tight spot in a, a, a residential garden probably, but say along a, a, um, a post and rails fence out in the country or something like that. Absolutely spectacular! Absolutely spectacular! And they ages and ages and the pollinators just buzz all over them they're oh i just love them yeah so underused too i don't i don't see them in that many gardens outside of public gardens yeah that's underused. absolutely they're underused and i think it's too bad i would like to to maybe you know do a pr show for them <laughs> <laughs> the, the senna pr campaign so and it does look almost tropical like when you see it you're like is that a native plant to our area but yes it is right if I have lots of seed if you want some. <laughs> All right. I'm going to take you up on that, Ruth. I'm going to try it out in my pollinator strip, uh, my pollinator hell strip out front. That'll be a perfect place for it. Perfect place for this plant, hell strip, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about your choice, Greg? Oh, I, I absolutely, absolutely I love and adore, and I've never seen the deer eat butterfly flower or butterfly weed, as a lot of people call it, Asclepius tuberosa amazing plant and when you see that orange in the summertime you see the way the butterflies go for it it gets ignored every other time of the year mm -hmm. but when it blooms without i mean especially in the one garden where we have it uh, we have it in a front entry pollinator garden we also have it in a meadow everybody asks what is that oh my gosh it's so gorgeous what is that and uh so so that would be my pick asclepius tuberosa why don't they go for it, Greg? Well, it is in the milkweed family. So it actually has a poison in it. It's not, uh, many of the milkweeds have the actual sap, but it's something that uh, actually ca causes uh, heart failure. Uh, so it's poisonous. And deer, leave it alone because they just know by instinct not to eat that plant. Hmm. Great choices. Yeah. So so now I want to hear why Ruth doesn't like the composite uh, yellow daisies. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yes, you tell them, Ruth, you tell them. And then I'll tell you my version. <laughs> Very American. But, um, I mean, I'll be, you know, they're native around here over, over in this country, which is terrific. And actually, it was as a child, both my mother and my grandmother would but big gardeners. And so a lot of the natives that we had, not so much the yellow daisies, but particularly asters and stuff like that, mm -hmm. um, we were growing as cultivated plants, which is perfectly fine. You know, and then of course, as the saying goes, the, the Brits did lots of hybridizing and sent, went, sent the plants back to the States when they were respectable. But anyway, <laughs> um, that's, that's the comment. So, um, no, I think, I, 
you know, you've got Silphium and Coryopsis and just all of them, and all yellow daisies. I mean, there's more to life than yellow daisies. Yep. And so, um, I just give Greg a hard time about that. But, <laughs> you know. It's okay. This all stemmed from, from I love you too, dear. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> She's the best. I mean, really, Ruth is my dearest friend. She really is. I just adore this woman. She's a delight to be with. Even when she tries to sound like she's being mean, she's not mean. She's just <laughs> nice. so don't don't even worry about it. She's a big teddy bear. Um, but what she was poking fun at was I had on another uh, when we were with Terry Spite uh, and we had been talking. She said, "What's an underutilized plant?" And I said, "Silphium." Uh, oh. Really, they're they're underutilized in in the garden. Um, they can be on the big side, but the deer don't like that foliage. They just don't like eating it. And, and of course, Ruth put, she, I had just talked also about Heliopsis and mm. Helianthus, which is, are also <laughs> ones deer don't eat. And they also have composite flowers. So that's where that comes from. Yeah, but, I mean, they're spectacular. Honestly, I think that I have not, I mean, I think this country is so fortunate to have so many wonderful native plants, absolutely wonderful native plants. And it's a shame over the years that uh, so many gardeners have wanted to have an English garden or a Japanese garden or something like that when we have so many wonderful natives here and there's nothing wrong with having all natives or all exotics that we call them exotics but yeah. a mixture it's you know it's your own choice and I think people need to remember this is to give them pleasure and the passes by hopefully but um, you know we tend to get a little rigid and say oh everything has to be native has to be native within 50 miles of my home or whatever and, and that's fine for people that absolutely have to have that but in general particularly for new gardeners coming on there's a lot in horticulture that those of us who are in the business so to speak just take for granted and I think it's important to remember to try to bring people along gently and say well why don't you try this and if it you know if you don't make it well you know I'll give you another one and see how you make out with that in a different spot it's um I'm very I'm very interested in trying to bring people along and uh, apparently last year in 2020 there was something like six million new gardeners or something went through the, the COVID yeah. and so, I mean, we need to try and keep those people for, um, you know, for the industry and so forth, which is enormous. And there's plenty of room for everybody. And um, I think to have part of the, the reason for the book is um, from my standpoint, and I think Greg, I'm speaking for you as well. Uh, we're trying to, uh, to help people and to bring them along gently, not just blind them with uh, science, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Latin names, common names, all that tends to be very, very difficult for people. And they go to a nursery and they see something in bloom and they say, oh, that's pretty, I'll take it home. Don't have a clue about it. You know, it's, um, I mean, you know all these things, but I think it's good to repeat it and remind um, people who are just starting out that it's, there's a great big gardening world out there and it's fabulous. Yeah, that's yeah, great deep. points. And yeah, what you said earlier too, uh, Ruth, about people throwing up their hands once the deer come through or they start to have deer predation yep. in their neighborhood and giving up on gardening entirely. And that would just break my heart yep. uh, when that was really happening so much 10 to 15 years ago. And I hope some of them have come back to gardening in this next wave and given it a try again. Yeah. And if we can, if we can help people to have them understand that um, there are plants you can choose and strategies along with those plants to to help them uh, be able to be more successful with deer. Um, can you imagine having a garden you put in and then only the next day to find it all chewed down? That, yes. that would be very discouraging. And um, the one, one point I did want to bring up about native plants, um, I've always been a native plant enthusiast. I love non-native plants as well. I mean, Nepeta, oh my gosh, what mm. an incredible plant. It's, yeah. it's European, but if we can think of how it's also helping our pollinators and, and our, our, our bee species, our wasps, our flies, um, all those, it's, it's important to consider. So if we can also create a garden that's beautiful, a garden that's deer resistant, and also eat, uh, fills a good role in ecology, we're, we're doing, we're doing a, um, really a good service to uh, the gardening world and, and to our natural world. The one, one um, I, I would, one quote that I like to tell people that is a guiding quote for me is from Doug Tallamy. Um, and he said, in far too many areas of our country, there's no place left for wildlife, but in the gardens and landscapes, we ourselves create. So 
we may not do all native, but if we can do predominantly native, deer resistant native, yeah. and then pollinator compatible non-natives, we're, we're reaching a striking a good balance. Hmm. Great point. And yeah, I would say, you know, if you can create that type of garden, that's a win, 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 you know, yeah. for <laughs> the wildlife, for humans, yeah, for, exactly. for our next generations of humans too. It's not just all about us. We have to think about the next generations coming, going behind mm-hmm. us too. And so where can our listeners find you both online and then to purchase the book? It's published by Timber Press. So I, I would assume you can order it through Amazon. We'll put a link up with the show notes as well for, to do the order. Mm-hmm. But um, Ruth, if you want to talk about your social media and website or where people can find you and then Greg. Sure. I have, I have, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook. And um, of course, I have email as well. And as far as the, the um, place, places to get the book, uh, Amazon certainly and Barnes & Noble as well is carrying it. But also, um, I've been talking to uh, people in various public gardens, uh, okay. such as uh, Bowman's Hill, for example, a wildflower garden, Lewis Ginter down in, in Rich- Richmond, um, New York Botanical Garden. All of these places have, have shops, gift shops, and they're all carrying it, which I'm very, very, very pleased about. Also, um, many of the independent bookstores um, that places that I have been off and on for over the years in various places are already carrying it. So um, I think you should not have any problem. And if you absolutely do have a problem getting the book, drop me a note. Great. And that's yeah. uh, Ruth Clausen, C-L-A-U-S-E-N. Yes. Um, that's spell her last name. And again, we'll have that link in the show notes. And then Greg, how do people find you on social media? Yeah. So I think the best way to, to get in touch, it, it really could be both Ruth and myself, but mm-hmm. I manage the, um, the uh, Facebook page that is Deer Resistant Natives for the Northeast. And that's a great way to, to learn about it. Um, one of the other things I'm going to be putting on that Facebook page soon is an event that Ruth and I are doing. It's actually a program through our historic cemetery, Laurel Hill. And on March 18th at 6 p.m., we will be having a, um, we'll actually be having a discussion of the book and uh, people can pre-order there for signed copies as well. So, um, and that also supports not only our, our bookstore there, but our friends group that, that helps the cemetery. So. And- would that be like friends of Laurel Hill? How would they uh, find yep, that? Exactly. It's, it's, they would go to Laurel Hill Cemetery um, on, on the internet. Um, uh, uh, I think it's actually laurelhillcemetery.org. And, and if they look under programs, they'll find deer resistant native plants uh, as, as one of the programs. And um, they, could, they could sign up there, pre order books there. Um, that's another great outlet. And you'll get to hear us speak more about the, these excellent plants that are inside this book. Great. I'll try to include the link in the show notes as well. Um, great. And then any last final thoughts? So we've talked about not giving up gardening just because the deer <laughs> have moved in. Talked about some more um, strategic ways besides, uh, in addition to planting selected native plants. Um, but maybe a little bit about how each of you started gardening as children. What inspired you? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go ahead, Greg. Tell the truth. Oh, I'll tell it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I mentioned before, both my grandmother and my mother were big gardeners. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, literally at age two, I was already planting seeds and stuff. And I would stop by Woolworths on my way home from school when I got older and buy packets of seeds, several of which it turns out now are American natives. So. <laughs> Yeah, things like that, that we, we just grew them as annuals. And I thought, oh, these are so wonderful. So, um, I mean, I was just always interested in studied biology, of course, in high school and, well, boarding school it was. And then, um, I mean, it was just sort of a given. I was always going to go into it, except for the night before I was supposed to leave to, to go to horticulture school. And I said, my father was giving me this very serious, you know, you're going away from home talk. And I said, you know, I don't think I want to do horticulture. I think I want to do dairying. There was another cl- another course for dairying. And he said, well, what's the odds that you're going to marry a dairy person? <laughs> 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 Nothing to do with it whatsoever. But and, <laughs> so um, I did. I went into horticulture and I loved it. And I do. And I find 
you know, I, I mentioned earlier that I've been in the business for so many years and every year it's more exciting to me. And um, I, I, I just think it's absolutely fab. Now I'm working on my three and a half year old granddaughter to try to make her the same as I am in terms of, of you know, when we go in the woods, I, we go and look at different things. And I say, look at that one. It's got all jagged edges to the leaves. I wonder why that one is like that. <laughs> and she just looks at me like, oh, you poor thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> No, she, she's she's very enthusiastic, and I'm hoping that I'm going to make a gardener out of her. But um, it's just, I mean, I can remember things in my grandmother's garden. We had she had a, a big tennis court. It was a beautiful house, and uh, there was a fabulous rock garden that was raised all the way along one side. On the other side of the tennis court, there was a lavender hedge. All all lavender. We used to go as a child. I'd go and pick lavender. We'd make lavender sachets and all this kind of stuff. But gardening's just always been part of my soul, and I think. You know, I wonder why my kids aren't the same way, but they're into their own things, of course. And uh, but I can't think of anything that would please me more. Really, I'm very, very, very fortunate. Nice, and well, small nice, circle. Yeah. Nice, very nice people. Yes. Mm. I like hey, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, um, I was very lucky to grow up. Um, in a family that had some horticulture already. I wouldn't say my mom and dad were, were horticulturists, but they, they were novel gardeners. And my mother encouraged me, my very first uh, interest, uh, by the time I was 13, I wanted to join the American Iris Society. And my mother, my mother paid for me to join. And uh, I, I bought my first, uh, she gave me $50 in 1982 to spend on irises. I thought, I've struck it rich. You know? <laughs> Thanks, mom. And I did. It was great. So it was a good experience. But for me, what was most profound were those five acres I grew up on. Mm. Two streams, woods. I saw toothwort in the spring. Um, and beautiful erythroniums, the, the dog tooth violet, some people call them, also bloodroot. So this was seeing the wild plants. And that's what I, I fell in love with. Had an excellent mentor in my teens, worked in her wildflower garden, uh, Mrs. Brenneman. And uh, Mrs. Brenneman attended the Barnes Foundation classes and passed along her information to me. Uh, and then um, also did wild collecting with a another very well-known botanist, Dr. Edgar Weary. Oh. And so um, he, his information passed to her, she passed to me. And so, um, so I think that's why native plants have always had a special meaning to me. Um, and the idea of sense of place, um, th that's really big. But for as a child, I never, ever, ever went into the woods where I wasn't 100% delighted, elated, happy, and come out and I was like, oh gosh, I just nurture these plants a little bit and look what they do. Wow, this is cool. So I was hooked, just like Ruth early on. There's no going back. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah, what about you, Kathy? <laughs> <laughs> this is, I was going to drop a, a little known fact about me when you mentioned Ruth buying uh, wildflower seeds at uh, Woolworth is that I spent my college breaks, besides doing journalism internships, working at Woolworths. <laughs> <laughs> there you yeah, go. Yeah. Shortly before the, the whole corporation folded, that wasn't my fault. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I grew up uh, with uh, farmers and gardeners on both sides of my family tree. And as a, as a small child, I didn't love gardening. I must say that uh, I was the one who was in charge of, of hauling water to our community garden plot in heavy jugs and helping weed. So that wasn't the most fun part. But when I was let loose in my grandparents' gardens and got to play and rearrange the garden gnomes and pick herbs and make little fairy crowns and things, then I was in heaven. So that it wasn't the work that I was interested in, of course, as much. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. Yes. Good memories, though. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much, both of you, for sharing uh, the deer resistant strategies and plants. And everybody should run out and grab that book and sign up for your talk on the 18th. And thank you again, Ruth and Greg. You're quite welcome. Thank you. You bet. Glad to be here. Yucca plant profile. Yucca filamentosa, 
is a tough plant that is native to the central and eastern United States. It is hardy to USDA zones 5 through 10. It is commonly known as Adam's needle, needle palm, or simply yucca, or yucca. In early summer, this broadleaf evergreen shrub puts up a tall flower spike that is striking and also a pollinator magnet. For fun, after the blossoms drop, I like to spray paint the remaining spike in a bright tropical color and leave it up for the rest of the summer. Though it looks like a hot desert plant, it has no problem withstanding ice and snow. There is the straight green species as well as several variegated forms available at local garden centers. The most popular of the variegated cultivars is Color Guard. Yucca is easy to grow from rhizome divisions. Just dig up a section, cut it into three inch part, and plant them. I also find it fairly easy to divide the clumps and replant them in new locations. Yucca prefer full sun and well draining soil. They need no fertilizing or extra watering. They are rabbit and deer resistant. They are also a great choice for along street edges as they are salt spray and pollution resistant. Yucca, you can grow that. What's new this week? Well, my February gold daffodils have finally bloomed and on their tail is the tete-a-tete daffodils who quickly follow along my fence line and both are sunny yellow looking brilliant today and I'm cutting bouquets from both to enjoy on my desk here as I work. Uh, inside, I am proud to announce that this is our 50th episode of the Garden DC podcast. So we are going to give out a couple prizes. So listen carefully for how to enter. Uh, We have been generously gifted a copy of Deer Resistant Native Plants for the Northeast by this episode's guest speakers, Ruth Rogers Clausen and Greg Tepper. So to win a copy of that, Um, go to the Washington Gardener YouTube channel, and I'll give you that exact address. That's youtube.com backslash Washington Gardener Magazine, all one word, no spaces or dashes or anything, just Washington Gardener Magazine, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't worry if you've already subscribed to our YouTube channel, because we will pick a winner from among all the subscribers to the YouTube channel, new and old. And along with that book, I'm going to throw in a digital subscription to Washington Gardener Magazine as well. So you get two prizes. So go ahead and hit that subscription button and you'll see a couple surprises coming up on that YouTube channel this week. Um, We're going to share a video of my chat with Greg and Ruth. And that's just a little preview of what we hope to build this Garden DC podcast into um, As we come out of COVID and more of us get our vaccine and we're out and about more in the world, I hope to do more in-person interviews and visual videos to go with this podcast. So hope you all enjoy that. And um, elsewhere in the gardening world, the DC Environmental Film Festival is taking place next weekend. And my intern for the spring, Chloe Quill, and I are previewing a few of those new um, films coming out and we will be posting to washingtongardener.blogspot.com our reviews of the garden related titles at the dc environmental film festival also at the blog you'll see an announcement of our spring garden book club which takes place over zoom so it's open to anybody in the world to participate in and we are discussing a fiction book this time we normally do nonfiction, but occasionally non uh, occasionally a novel and this one is the last garden in england by julia kelly so Grab a copy of that book and join us for the Garden Book Club meeting. That will be on Thursday, April 29th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Also on the blog, we have a recap of the recent Rooting DC and MOFA meeting, as well as of some fun uh, quotes, inspirational quotes that we're posting every Monday. A DIY project of how to make a planter out of your yard flamingo. And um, a little 
inspiration and some ideas of how you can have your own petal porch for the National Cherry Blossom Festival. And we are planning big things here at Washington Gardener HQ (laughs) in our back garden to have a big pink uh, flamingo and cherry blossom display entered in that petal porch uh, decoration. Not quite a competition, more as a display. Um, So look out for that. We'll be posting on all our social media before, during, and after photos and letting you all know when you can come and visit that in person with your mask on and socially distanced, or you can just enjoy the photos online. So I hope you think about decorating your own petal porch for this beginning of springtime, right of spring in Washington, D.C., the National Cherry Blossom Festival, or just get out there in your garden and have some fun. Things are springing. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter by going to anchor.fm backslash Kathy dash gents backslash support. For as little as 99 cents a month, you can become a listener supporter and we'll give you a shout out in a future episode. Another way to support Garden DC is to go to washingtongardener.com and subscribe to Washington Gardener Magazine. You can find Washington Gardener online at washingtongardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.